Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. In the last episode, we took a look at uh, an LSI nitrogen laser that I'd acquired off eBay uh, for very, very cheap. Uh, it was, it's capable of driving a, a small dye laser, as we saw in the last video, uh, but obviously uh, we want more power. So over the last uh, couple of years, actually, I've been developing my own uh, home-built nitrogen lasers. Um, these are TEA nitrogen lasers, and I have an example of one here. In a moment, we'll stick this on the bench, uh, I'll go through some of the theory of these things, uh, some of the design considerations. I mean, these things can be really, really easy to build, uh, but building them well is, a, is, a, is another matter. So let's go. When we looked at nitrogen laser schematics last time, uh, we learned that there are two sort of basic uh, types, uh, two basic methods, I suppose, of pumping the laser channel. Uh, the top diagram is the LC inversion circuit, sometimes referred to as a Blum line. Uh, and the second diagram underneath um, is the charge transfer circuit. Uh, these work kind of similarly, kind of differently, depending on sort of which way you look at things. In the first circuit, we've got two equal capacitances uh, either side of the laser channel, which is denoted by the two arrows. When we apply a high voltage, both of these capacitors charge up uh, via the inductance uh, across the laser channel. And when the spark gap fires, it essentially short circuits one side uh, of the laser. So it brings the voltage across this capacitor down to zero and it does so so quickly that a charge builds up across the, uh, across the channel, causing the laser to fire. Um, this is the, the circuit that was shown in Scientific American back in the day, and it's, it's quite common uh, with nitrogen lasers. Uh, in the second circuit, uh, we've got, again, two capacitances, except this time they're arranged ever so slightly differently. We've got a large capacitance here called CD, which is the dumping capacitor, and its, uh, its capacity is generally about three or four times the peaking capacitor, which is shown to the right. And the idea with this is we charge up the dumping capacitor to a very high voltage. And when the spark gap breaks down, it very, very rapidly charges the peaking capacitor uh, here, uh, which then discharges its energy into the laser channel. Both of these circuits are capable of generating very, very fast um, high rise time discharges. You know, you're talking times in the order of uh, a few nanoseconds to discharge all of the energy into the laser channel. The reason why, we're, why I'm showing two diagrams again is because I've been spending you know, quite a bit of time over the last few years developing nitrogen lasers. Um, and I've actually built both of these circuits up. Um, and there are pros and cons for each one, uh, as we'll see shortly. This is one of my early uh, atmospheric pressure nitrogen lasers, or an early attempt to, to do a good job, as it were. Uh, you'll see a lot of designs for these all over the internet where they're sort of hammered together out of you know bits of tinfoil, bits of aluminium, bits of plastic. I wanted to make something that was robust and you could actually move it around without it falling to bits and you're having to spend hours uh, realigning uh, all of the bits and pieces. So I'll just walk you through um, everything that's, that's on here. Um, underneath we've got a sheet of uh, aluminium, so it's a nice big piece of four millimeter thick aluminium. Uh, with everything bolted to it uh, so obviously we can just pick this up move it around uh, plug it in fire it up do whatever with it um, the sheet of plastic itself is 190 micron um, acetate sheet uh, for making stencils uh, we can see either side of the laser channel uh, we've got just it is actually plain old uh, aluminium kitchen foil um, obviously i've cut it you know spent some time cutting these things to to, to size at the top here we've got a uh, spark gap we can see the inductor uh, running across the channel this bit is actually still held down by gravity um, it, it was a design that ultimately i gave up on i mean it's 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 actually really good and it, it can produce you know quite a significant uh, output of ultraviolet light uh, but there were improvements that could be made and you know designing lasers or anything else uh, really should be uh, pretty much an iterative process uh, you can you know you can get so far with a particular idea and then maybe rethink uh, these things um, so yeah, we've got, we've got a pressurized spark gap up the top here. This is actually made out of plumbing fittings. Um, it's bolted down uh, to the base plate on one side. This would be the ground. Um, this would be the high voltage. Uh, there's, a, there's only a short gap uh, between uh, the high voltage and the, and the ground. So, you know, obviously we can see right away that there are issues um, right there. Um, so essentially this is C1. Um, uh, sorry, this is C1 in our diagram. Uh, this is C2. Uh, if we applied a high voltage to this, the inductor would allow both sides to charge up, spark gap would fire, um, and the discharge would occur across the laser channel. Uh, the laser channel itself is in a plexiglass box. Uh, it's adjustable by means of screws here and here, um, and it's spring-loaded as well. 
Um, the idea is that uh, you know, we can adjust it for op optimal uh, discharge across the length of the channel. Uh, the spark gap itself is pressurized. Uh, so there's a wee piece of silicone hose that feeds the spark gap and we pressurize this with nitrogen. Um, and the laser channel itself, we just feed in nitrogen at atmospheric pressure. Uh, the valve on the right hand side is actually from an aquarium pump. None of the things in here uh, are exotic. It's all materials that you can get from hardware stores and so on. Uh, with the exception of the, the brass block on the back, uh, this is actually a mount for a laser diode. Uh, and the reason I've used this mount in here is because I'd re you know, instead of mounting a laser diode in the back of it, mounted a mirror in the back of it. Uh, there are four um, threaded holes um, and it, it makes an ideal miniaturized mirror mount. The electrodes themselves are inside the plexiglass box and run the length as you can see. Uh, these are actually hexagonal cross-section um, lengths of aluminium. You can just buy these. Uh, this is eight millimeters across flats. Um, out of all of the electro profiles that I tried, so I've tried all sorts of things. I've tried like angle aluminium, I've tried flat pieces of aluminium, uh, round bar and so on. Uh, hexagonal bar has far and away um, proved to be the, the best uh, electro profile for this particular application. Um, an important sort of aspect of, nit of nitrogen lasers is making sure that the contacts between the electrodes and the aluminium is really, really good and the contact between the spark gap and the aluminium is very, very good. So this is why everything's bolted down. So the spark gap's bolted down um, over here and to bolt down the laser channel, um, I've put uh, pieces of plexiglass across it and then bolted it down with a, a piece of aluminium bar. Uh, you know, this design's okay, and it's the most common design that you'll find on the internet. Uh, like I say, a, a lot of the designs you'll find uh, sort of held together with gravity and little bits of junk. Uh, it does have its issues, though. Uh, one of the main drawbacks to this particular design, this, uh, the LC inversion circuit or bloom line, is that when we apply voltage here, the voltage that we apply is, is always on uh, between the, the top layer of aluminium sheet and the bottom layer. Uh, and what this means is you know, a number of things can happen. First off, um, sparks can track um, across the surface. This is why we've got such a large gap all the way around. Uh, so, you know, it will ionize the air around the edges of the, of the aluminium and it will start um, to, to you know, produce massive corona in the dark. Uh, and eventually, you know, it'll, it'll cause breakdown across the, across the top of the sheet. Uh, the other issue is because we're permanently applying voltage to this you know, very, very flimsy homemade capacitor, as it were, um, quite often, you know, you run this for maybe, uh, you know, this is pretty good, I think. You can maybe run it for like 100 shots uh, and then the dielectric would break down and then you'd have to tear the whole thing apart. You'd have to cut a new sheet, cut some more new aluminium, put it all back together. And it's kind of a pain in the arse. So, I'll, you know, there are, there are better designs. So this is my latest nitrogen laser design. As you can see, it's significantly smaller um, than the one that I've just showed you a minute ago. Um, the performance is, is much better, um, even though it's a smaller size. And there are a number of sort of features that we'll talk about um, in, this, in this particular design. This is the charge transfer circuit design, where over on one side, we have a collection of four doorknob capacitors. Uh, these form the dumper, um, in, you know, as opposed to the peaker. Um, we've got one sheet of aluminium which forms the peaking capacitor itself. And again, um, underneath this, I wonder if I can pick it up at the edge. Probably not. Probably shouldn't disturb it really, but yeah, if we could pick it up at one side. Again, we've, we've got the same acetate sheet, 190 microns, except this time we only have you know, one capacitor that's, that's homemade essentially. Um, between the dumper and the peaker, we have the spark gap. Um, again, this is made in exactly the same way as the one that I showed you previously, except there's been a number of modifications. Uh, we've got an inlet at the top uh, to pressurize it with nitrogen. Uh, this particular spark gap can run anywhere between uh, one and two bars. Um, I've tested it up to about nearly three bars and it's been just fine. Um, I've added in um, plexiglass discs um, so the, you know, to reduce the possibility of high voltage breakdown. We can actually see as well in the last design I showed you that there was a huge uh, border of plastic all the way around um, our capacitors. We've only got a very, very small border here. In fact, when this one fires, it does generate corona, but you know, very, 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 very small amount of corona. And I'll go, go into why that is in a moment. The laser channel itself is designed in exactly the same way. Uh, we've got two hexagonal uh, profile aluminium bars. Uh, these are both adjustable um, so that you can, you can optimize the gap uh, between the two rails. We've got the mirror mount at the back. We've got an optional um, resistor 
um, connecting the peaking capacitor to ground um, and the idea is that this will discharge this capacitor between shots and again we've got um, a little aquarium valve at the back. Um, the reason we can get away with such a small border uh, around our peaking capacitor is when this spark gap fires, because it's pressurized, uh, the spark gap actually fires very, very quickly, incredibly quickly, you know, a few, a few nanoseconds um, tops. And w when, it, when it fires, the discharge is so fast that, uh, and it's over so fast that there just isn't time um, for significant corona to form around the edges. Um, as, an, as an additional bonus, because we're not permanently applying voltage um, to our dielectric, it's only actually, uh, voltage is only applied to this whenever the spark gap fires, uh, we're not stressing the dielectric all the time um, and it's less likely to cause damage. Uh, the performance of this thing, as you'll see shortly, is absolutely astounding for something that's, that's homemade. It can easily pump dye lasers, uh, it can easily pump a, a cuvette uh, with some dye in it to threshold without even a proper laser cavity. Um, it's pretty cool. Because the charge transfer uh, design worked so very, very well, um, I you know, decided to make a little experiment to see if you could scale this thing down um, and still have a laser that would, that would have a reasonable performance. Um, so here it is. Uh, the laser channel itself is only six centimeters long. Um, that's it. So we've got our two aluminum bars in here. Um, there's no sort of room uh, to adjust. Uh, so the way this is adjusted is I've cut two, two, uh, two small strips of plastic that I put down the laser channel. Um, under the bolts, tighten it up so that the, the plastic's tight all the way along and then just pull the plastic out and it's, it's a roundabout right. We've got a wee mirror mount at the back, we've got our spark gap and we've got our dumping capacitor at the back there. We've only got one uh, small dumping capacitor uh, but the output from this again is, is really really impressive, far more than the LSI nitrogen laser that I showed last time. We've got an additional resistor to discharge uh, our peaking capacitor and that's it, a very very miniature design, I mean it's really tiny uh, the thing is, is practically, you know, you can hold it in your hand. I mean, obviously, you've got power supply and gas handling to go along with this, so, you know, it's not exactly going to make a laser pointer, but um, very, very cool nonetheless. Um, all this is built on uh, a good, you know, 5 millimeter thick piece of aluminium. Um, it's, it's an excellent, robust build. I mean, you could chuck this in a drawer, forget about it, pull it back out, fire it up, and it just fire up straight away. Um, as with the other design, we've got a single mirror at the back. Uh, you might be able to see the mirror mount. I'll just check our focus. Yeah, so this is a laser dialed mount that's been drilled out. Um, I've put a first surface mirror inside it and, and just uh, reapplied three of the bolts with uh, small spring washers um, to act as the rear mirror. Here's the power supply that we're going to use to drive the nitrogen laser. There's actually two parts to this. Um, at the bottom, we've got a, a, a bog standard linear power supply. Um, this actually uses a Variac, um, like the good old days. There's a good reason for this. Uh, we're generating high voltage and every time the laser fires, it generates uh, quite a hefty um, electromagnetic pulse, um, which plays havoc with digital supplies. So I've purpose built uh, the power supply at the bottom um, for this purpose. On the top, we've got the high voltage power supply itself. Uh, there's a micro ammeter on the right hand side. It actually reads uh, kilovolts, um, you know, thousands of volts. Uh, this power supply is capable of generating up to 35,000 volts uh, really quite easily. Um, if we power it on, I'll just, I'll just tweak it down a wee bit. Um, nothing very exciting. We can read on the meter there. It's, it says about 16, turning up to about 20,000 volts and we'll be able to draw a small spark. Um, off the output. Um, if we turn it away up, uh, I think that's about as high as I'm prepared to go. It's nearly 30,000 volts. Uh, we can generate quite a lot of corona. Um, there's actually quite a lot of current flows um, in this output, believe it or not. Um, it's actually, um, we've got a ballast resistor um, to make sure that we don't, uh, that we don't fry the power supply when we come to run it. Over here we have a supply of nitrogen. Uh, this is just a small um, welding bottle um, of nitrogen. Um, I built a small manifold for it so that we can feed the spark gap um, and, the, and the nitrogen, you know, the laser channel itself independently. 
I've got a, a small pressure gauge on there. So the nitrogen laser is set up. We've got a high voltage feed uh, coming off the power supply. And we've got a ground connection. Uh, the nitrogen is turned on. We're currently applying about a bar of pressure um, to the spark gap. Uh, we've got no nitrogen fl uh, flowing through the channel. These things will run off air, um, but it is important to pressurize the spark gap. So let's turn it on. So at the moment it's, it's firing, but we have a, a spark at one end. Uh, we'll have to deal with that. So I've just powered it up. It's been moved around a bit. We've got uh, sparking going on at one end. So we'll get the screwdriver and we'll adjust that. So it should be a relatively quick adjustment. Now we've got sparking at the other end, so we've turned it just a wee bit too far. Bit more. Right, sparking at both ends, I can live with that. Um, we'll turn it up to about one and a half bars and we'll get a much faster discharge. I'll just try it again. So you, you should be able to hear the spark gap. So obviously um, I'm gonna put a piece of fluorescent paper in front of this so that we can see what's happening. Um, I won't be able to talk very much when it's firing because it is quite loud, um, even with everything enclosed. Um, so I'll get some paper. So I've put a piece of paper in front of the, in front of the laser channel. As I explained last week, paper has uh, fluorescent dye in it um, to help uh, alter the color balance. Dust there. Um, when we come to fire the laser, we should see the fluorescence. Now, it's worth bearing in, in mind that when I first start this, we're just going to use plain ordinary air in the channel. Uh, we're not going to flood it with nitrogen. Uh, air, you know, as it comprises of mostly nitrogen, uh, will laze. Um, it won't laze very, very brightly because oxygen poisons it. Um, but it's worth seeing anyway. So let's fire it up. So you should have been able to see the, the output spot very clearly. Um, I'm just going to crack open the needle valve and let some nitrogen into the, into the channel. There we go, and we'll run it again. Now this time it's much brighter. So this time it was much, much brighter. Um, so that's that. I mean. Obviously we can do cool things like pumping dye lasers with this, so let's give that a go. So here's the dye laser from last time. Um, we'll just turn the nitrogen laser on. That was pretty cool as well, very, very bright. It's worth noting that I'm actually filming this in room light. Um, all the lights are on, the, the blind for the window is half open, um, and it's way bright enough for the camera to pick this up. Um, very, very interesting property of this particular nitrogen laser. When it discharges, you're probably talking a good uh, three, four, maybe 500 uh, kilowatts uh, output power in the beam, uh, you know, in a few nanoseconds. Uh, we don't even need mirrors um, in the dye laser in order for it to uh, to laze. So we can get some, uh, I'll get a curvette holder. So we can just stick a curvette in front of the beam. I might have to do some um, balancing. Let me give me that a nine volt battery there. So here's, here's just a bare curvette and we'll fire up the laser. So what's happening here is this. We've got a, a, a simple curvette of rhodamine 6G um, in alcohol. And the, the peak power from this is so huge 
that we don't even need mirrors um, to, to feed back, um, as it were, inside of the laser cavity. Um, essentially, we can just slap a curvette in front of the nitrogen laser, fire it up, and two laser beams appear out of each side of the curvette, which is really, really cool. Um, obviously, we can change the die. So this is a, a Kumarin die, uh, like you'd find in optical brightener. And just like that, just like that, two laser beams appear out the side of the curvette. Um, so obviously the peak power uh, in this system is incredible. Um, a really, really cool thing we can actually do with this is to set up the uh, is to set up this in the die laser. So the Kumarin die in the in the die laser um, emits uh, violet light, um, and this should probably be enough uh, to pump this die laser uh, as well, or this curvette rather as well. So let's just rearrange things around here. Let's just set this up so that it lazies. So I've zoomed in on the die laser assembly here. So I've got regular die laser with uh, Kamarin die in it, um, you know, as before. The output from this die laser is focused um, onto the surface of the curvette containing Rhodamine 6G. And when we fire it, if we look carefully at the paper at the back, I don't know how well this is going to show up on camera, but we should be able to see all sorts of lasing going on. So what we'll be able to see here is when this uh, starts lasing, we're focusing the output onto the cuvette. Uh, two beams will emerge, one that will come forward towards the camera uh, and one that will go backwards towards a sheet of paper. And around about here, we'll see uh, the orange um, output of the Rhodamine 6G. Now we'll operate the laser in the dark and see if we can see the beams. So not much to see on the camera right now. Uh, it's quite dark in here. It's very difficult to video pulse lasers like this. Um, oftentimes, when you hear the spark gap fire, you don't see the beam appear. Um, this is because the beam is essentially appearing in between frames, um, so the, the camera essentially misses it. Um, the effect is reduced at higher repetition rates. Um, you'll also notice that when I tried to video this thing in very low light conditions, um, the, the attempt was particularly poor. So in this image that you can see just now, uh, this is a, a, a two second long exposure. Um, still image of the of the die laser pumping another die laser and you can quite clearly see uh, the blue beam um, hitting the uh, Rhodamine 6G curvet and, and obviously the orange beam um, exiting from the curvet. Um, to set this up, uh, like I say, it was a, it was a long exposure picture, um, a wee bit of smoke in the, in, in the, in the air in the room. Um, what, what you're actually seeing now is what you would expect to see in real life. Um, this is almost exactly how it appears to the human eye when you're looking at these things. Just as an additional aside, we'll try and capture uh, the discharge in the laser channel as well. This might appear weird on the camera because of the rolling shutter, but we'll give it a go. So we can see we had quite a homogeneous discharge um, which is one of the telltale signs of a really well-built nitrogen laser. We can actually get a very, very high repetition rate out of this system as well. Um, I'll just fire it up one more time and then turn up the wick on this thing um, and see you know, what, what kind of repetition rate we can get out of it.
let's move on and try the smaller nitrogen laser. Um, because the nitrogen laser is smaller and the capacitance is so much smaller, um, the repetition rate we're going to get out of that is much, much higher. So this is the tiny nitrogen laser all set up. Remember, this only has a six centimeter long channel. Um, I've put a piece of paper in front of the output and we will just fire it. As you can tell, the repetition rate is much, much higher. Let's use it to pump the dye laser. So here we can see a cuvette being driven to super radiance. Uh, we won't be able to use the dye laser to pump another dye laser like we did earlier. It's just not powerful enough, but it will drive this cuvette to super radiance, no problem. Thanks for watching this episode of Les's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe, uh, and I'll see you guys next time.